there is a secret formula to generating or creating the perfect group game that actually motivates autistic children, young adults, students to want to participate and want to interact with each other. And that is what I'm going to share with you today. Hello, YouTube fam. It's Rebecca Robbins from MindShaper SLP, and we are winding down to the end of the summer, unfortunately, Ooh. <laughs> which means that fall is right around the corner, and it also means that there's another semester of Buddy Group that we are currently enrolling in honor of Buddy Group enrollment season for the fall. Today's video is going to be focused on how you can create games that actually encourage your students to want to interact with each other or encourage your child or maybe your children to want to interact with each other or their peers. Over the years in Buddy Group, the program has shifted and changed quite a bit. I started the program back in 2018, the fall of 2018, which means that Buddy Group is turning six years old this fall. Oh my goodness, happy birthday, Buddy Group. <laughs> when I first started Buddy Group, we had two hour long classes. I didn't want the whole class to be focused on lessons and doing curriculum based activities. So we had a lot of downtime in these classes. One of my favorite parts of the class was at the end of class, I had the luxury of sectioning off a good chunk of time at the end of class to facilitate really fun collaborative games. And now Buddy Group's classes are one hour long and we have maintained that closing activity in the class because what I found in conducting these classes was that that ending game was when my students were really bonding and connecting the most. And it was probably their favorite part of class. It was one of my favorite parts of class too. And it's where they had the most fun and you could see them wanting to interact with each other. You could see them actually forming connections with each other. You saw them helping each other out. Sometimes there was kids that needed a little more support to get through the games and the kids that were better able to participate in the games would help the ones that needed more support. It was so beautiful to see, and it is so beautiful to see to this day as we continue these type of activities in my class. What I have come to realize over the years is that there is a secret formula to generating or creating the perfect group game that actually motivates autistic children, young adults, students to want to participate and want to interact with each other. And that is what I'm going to share with you today. My secret recipe for creating the perfect group games for neurodivergent individuals to want to interact with each other. And if you are a, a teacher or a provider, you'll know that groups with neurodivergent children are not always easy to foster that desire or that motivation for them to want to interact with each other. Oftentimes, an autistic child or young adult will be more motivated to interact with adults than they will with their peers. Or they might be more motivated to just keep to themselves, or they're more entertained by participating in self-stimulatory behavior, or just entertaining themselves in a solo nature. But that's why every time I create these end games for these classes, what I'm always thinking about is the four ingredients to success for these games, these activities, so that my students want to interact with each other. I know that your curiosity is totally peaked. Before we get too far down the rabbit hole, I just wanna let you know, first and foremost, Buddy Group isn't open for enrollment now. If you live in New York and Pennsylvania, we have in-person classes in Goshen, New York this fall for ages 13 through adult and adults in their 20s. And we have virtual classes available for any resident of New York or PA, and we have 
teen and adult classes available levels one and two in the virtual program. And just because it's virtual, don't count it out. My virtual program is very, very successful. And I have a lot of families that prefer the virtual classes and their, their kids prefer the virtual classes. And I might make a video about the the value of virtual social groups in the future. So let me know in the comments below if that's something that you're interested in. I am the teacher for the virtual program and they are really, really successful, fun, engaging classes for my students. So if you're interested in Buddy Group, you can go to buddygrouprocks.com to find out more information and get on a call with me to find out if Buddy Group is the right fit for your family. Housekeeping item number two, is don't forget to like this video, subscribe, share with your friends, comment below, let me know your thoughts, let me know your questions. It means so much to me and helping my channel grow and get in front of other families who really need to hear this information to help their autistic loved ones thrive as well. Before we get too far into what my ingredients are for, for my recipe of success, I want to talk about the overarching principle that I use and that really was a big factor in me coming up with this perfect recipe for group activities. And it's based on the program RDI, Relationship Development Intervention. If you've been following me for any length of time, you've heard me mention this program before. Usually I'm talking about declarative language, which is an important part of that program. But the other really, really important foundational philosophy from RDI that has been a game changer in my therapy over the years has been co-regulation. That is really a principle that I am channeling or keeping in mind when I am creating these games or these activities for my students because co-regulation, it's a pre-relational skills. In order for us to relate to one another, to feel connected to one another, we need to be co-regulated. And I've given this example before, but I'm going to give it again because it really is such a great example that helps people truly understand what co-regulation is. So imagine that you have to move a big dining room table. Your friend's helping you move, right? Your best friend comes over and it's your job, the two of you, to move the big dining room table. The two of you are so connected and so in tune with each other. Let's say you've known each other for years that you could probably move that table without even saying a word to each other. And that is co-regulation in action. You're looking at each other, you're reading each other, you're gauging what each other is doing, and so you're moving in synchronicities with each other so that you can move that table with ease. Okay, now let's pretend your best friend couldn't come over to help you move and you and your partner just got in an argument because what better thing to cause an argument than moving with your partner, right? You just got in an argument, you're annoyed with each other and you guys have to move that table together. Now picture moving that table. Are you seeing it? It doesn't go as smoothly as it did with your best friend, is it? No, because you and your partner have just got in an argument. You are not co-regulated, which means you're probably not communicating well. You're moving left. He's moving right. It's just a, a much, much harder task because you don't have that solid connection happening, that solid co-regulation. I hope that kind of gives you a sense of what I mean when I say co-regulation. But to define it even further, I want to take a quote out of this book, The Co-Regulation Handbook by Linda Murphy. She's the same woman that wrote The Declarative Language Handbook. It's another just really quick read that really just gives you a really in-depth look as to what co-regulation is and how you can use it with your child. Definitely check it out. I want to read a quote from this book about what co-regulation is. In the book, she says, establishing co-regulation means that two people, for example, a child and a caregiver, or two children, two teens, two young adults, two autistic young adults are partners in an interaction in which they are responding contingently to each other moment to moment. Interactions are not predetermined, for example, as a script in a theater production might be, but are the fluid, ongoing, and unfolding process of continuous reciprocal communicative exchanges between individuals. In addition, there is balance. Each person contributes equally to the exchange. 
So let's break this down just a little bit. What does it mean that they are responding contingently to each other moment to moment? That means that what I do in this interaction with the person that I'm interacting with is contingent on what that person does. It's not predetermined. So for example, in the example of moving the, the table, if my best friend decides to lift the right side of her table in the air, I'm going to respond by moving my left side of the table in the air. So that's contingent on her moving the right side, I'm moving the left side, or vice versa. If she decides to lift her left side, I'm gonna lift my right side. What I do is contingent or dependent upon what my partner is doing. It's not predetermined, it's not scripted, scripted, AKA it is not ABA folks. <laughs> APA will not give you these results. But the fluid and ongoing and unfolding process of continuous reciprocal communicative exchanges. So you have to stay engaged with the person. You have to stay connected in order for co-regulation to happen. And if you think about your child, this is probably one of the biggest challenges for your child when they are in a social exchange with another person is staying connected staying engaged. And it's the thing that you're like, oh, how can I get my child to stay more engaged, to stay more connected when they're interacting with, with each other? Co-regulation activities, my friends, that is the way to go. They really are so hugely impactful. The other part I want to highlight, because this is an important thing that I build into my recipe for the perfect social group games, is the balance each person contributes equally to the exchange. And not only is there a balance, but there has to be genuine roles and responsibilities, which we're gonna get into. When I am describing these social group games, you can do these with your child, do a group game of two where you and your child are participating with each other using co-regulation games. You have to make sure that you are giving your child a genuine role and responsibility because if they don't have a genuine role of responsibility, they're going to see through that ish, yo. <laughs> they're going to know that they're not really needed and like you're doing all the heavy lifting. That's not going to be fulfilling for them. What is fulfilling in these interactions is that there is a genuine role and a genuine responsibility. For example, in order to work on co-regulation, sometimes I would bring like a heavy box of matchbox cars, okay? So if I had a student that liked to play with cars, I'd bring my, my bucket of matchbox cars. The heavier, the better. And I would ask the student to hold one handle and I would hold the other and we would carry it together to the therapy room. Now, if I held both handles myself and asked the student to, to help me, if my student let go, nothing would happen to that box, right? So my student wouldn't have a genuine role. I would really be doing literally all the heavy lifting. However, if I have one handle and my student has one handle, or if it was a group, the two students each have a handle. If one person drops their handle, the box drops. I would encourage you if you're trying something like this with carrying a heavy bag, try not to do breakable things, okay? If you're carrying like a heavy bag or box together with your child, let the box drop because that's going to show your child like, oh, I actually have an important role here. If I don't do my job, this box doesn't stay in the air. This box isn't gonna get transported to the room we're going. It helps them realize that they're needed. Their role is important. So that is an important part of co-regulation, that you're connected and that you each have a genuine equal role in the exchange. I tried not to go on too long about co-regulation. I feel like just as passionate about that as I do declarative language. It's important for me to go into it, but I also wanted to keep it brief so that we could really get into the meat of the matter Matter, which is the formula for successful interactive group games for autistic students. The type of activities that make your child or your students actually want to engage with each other. There's four ingredients to this recipe, four parts to this formula. Here I go again, mixing my metaphors. <laughs> number one, and it's number one because it is the most important, it must be interesting or 
fun to the participants. I'm going to say it again. It must be interesting or fun to the participants. For all of the group members, if the group members don't care about the activity, if they think the activity is boring, if they're not interested in the activity, they're not going to want to play. They're not going to be motivated. They're not going to be motivated to participate. They're not going to be motivated to talk to each other. You definitely want it to be interesting and fun to all of the participants. When I say participants, anyone who is involved in the group game, and you can do this as a family. This doesn't need to be for a speech therapist who is providing group speech therapy. It doesn't just have to be for that, for a special educator who has a group of students. It can also be you working with your family and you're doing a family game where you're working on interactions and connectedness within family members. But it has to be interesting and fun for all the participants. Otherwise, no one's going to want to play. That is one of the biggest factors for motivation. We are motivated to do things that we enjoy, that we're interested in that it feels fun for us to do. Think about boring activities. You're not super motivated to go do the dishes, right? Unless you really love the dishes. So it has to be interesting, has to be fun. Here are some ways that I like to use to get my activities interesting and fun for my students in buddy group. We incorporate competition. One of like my tried and true go-to strategies is I divide my group into teams and they have to compete against each other to complete some sort of challenge or goal, which, spoiler alert, leads me to factor number two for success, but we'll get there. If we can incorporate some friendly competition. I often also have to work on with my students in buddy group about coping skills and being a gracious winner, being a gracious loser in terms of games. If you incorporate competition, the students or the people that are involved are just more motivated. It's more fun because it's like, oh, can I win? Winning is fun. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm not competitive at all. Just ask my husband. <laughs> You put the opportunity for me to win and all of a sudden my motivation goes up tenfold. And it's true for a lot of my students as well, but we have to make sure that we're doing it in a way that still keeps it fun and not too competitive. So we incorporate some friendly competition. And I'll explain how I do that when I give some examples of some of the activities that we do in our buddy group. The other thing I do is incorporate movement. It's much more fun, especially for an autistic child, autistic teen, autistic adult, to incorporate movement in what they're doing rather than sitting still because it helps to wake up their sensory system. It helps their sensory system be more regulated so that they can access the part of their brain that is motivated to interact with each other, that is able to co-regulate with another individual because they're getting some of their sensory needs met as well when we incorporate the movement and it just keeps it more fun. I just find that movement activities are so much more effective with my autistic students and that definitely has been an element of my activities that has made the games much more motivating and enjoyable for my students in buddy group. So number one was it must be interesting or fun for everyone involved Number two, there must be a shared goal that the group is working towards achieving that everybody cares about. We're still incorporating that element number one, but there's a shared goal that we all have in mind and we all care about accomplishing that goal. The ways that I facilitate this in my activities is I will have some sort of a visual representation of what the end goal is because a lot of my students have executive functioning challenges. Maybe your child does too. So visualizing the future and visualizing what will happen at the end is difficult. Or maybe they have some receptive language challenges where they can't really understand what you're describing as the end goal would be using your word. So if you can create a visual representation of what the end goal is, that's going to help your child visualize it much easier, which is going to help increase their motivation to get to that end goal. The ways that I do that is I will use a picture. Some of these activities involved create a, a tower, for example. So I'll have a picture of the tower that we're working towards building so that they know what they have to match to do. Another way that I will 
visualize the end goal is use a video model. I will show a video to my group, my students, of how to play the game. And so they can see what the game looks like from beginning to end, and they can see what the end result of the game will be. And this works not just with games, but with activities that you're doing. A lot of times I find videos on YouTube that I use as video models. They don't have to be fancy that you're creating yourself. I do create my own video models from time to time. I have <laughs> my poor husband. I've roped him in from time to time to play a game or two so that we could create a video model for a buddy group to demonstrate what the game should look like and what the end result is of a certain game that we want to teach our buddy group classes. But a lot of times, especially if it's a well-known game that the group is participating in, you can find the video on YouTube. So anyway, you can visualize that end goal. It will help the students or your child that's participating in the game or the activity care about achieving that goal because now they can see it. Now they know what the end goal is. If you were doing this more from like a behavioral perspective, the end goal could be some sort of prize. I prefer to have the end goal be something that is a natural result of completing the task, a natural byproduct of the activity that is inherently motivating because that's just facilitating that intrinsic motivation. But it is possible that maybe the end goal is some sort of prize. So number one, it must be interesting or fun to the participants. Number two, there must be a shared goal that the group is working towards achieving that everyone cares about. Now that we have the shared goal, number three is the students must genuinely need each other in order to complete the goal. Now we have a shared goal in mind, they can visualize it, they want to get to that goal. So now we've structured the activity so that they need each other in order to achieve that goal. They cannot achieve that goal by themselves. And this comes from what I read earlier with that quote from the co-regulation handbook that each person contributes equally to the exchange. And not only that, when the students genuinely need each other, they're now motivated to interact with each other because they're motivated to get to that end goal. They know that the activity is going to be fun. They know they want to achieve that goal. They're motivated to achieve that goal. So they are motivated to interact with their teammate or the group members to get to that goal because they realize I need that person in order to get to my goal. And that's really where the magic comes in, in terms of that motivation to want to co-regulate and to want to interact with each other. The structuring of the activity so that the students actually need each other to complete the goal. I'll just explain how I do that in the actual examples. And I think that'll be the best way to demonstrate that. So number four is there must be clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Not only do the students need each other, but they must be very clear as to what their job is in the activity and what their role is and what their responsibility is. And again, just like we talked about when I was reading that quote from the co-regulation handbook, it has to be a genuine role, a genuine responsibility. It can't be like, oh yeah, here's your job. They'll know that and that will cause them to check out of the activity and be bored with the activity because they will know on a cellular level that their contribution is not genuine, it's not needed for the activity to keep going. It's important that each student feels needed in completing the goal in order to keep up that motivation to participate not only in the activity, but to engage with each other during the activity. Ways that I do this and again, I'm going to explain this a little more in the specific examples that I go through very shortly. And again, this is another thing that I got from RDI, but it's just like putting the ER at the end of the job. For example, one of the games that I'm going to tell you about is what I call collaborative tower building. Each of my students will have a bag or a basket or a box filled with blocks. And we have one person is the builder and the other people are the block givers. So that is a very clearly defined role. A builder 
or a block giver. Or sometimes I might say they're the asker because they have to ask for the block, the asker and the giver. Then we do rotate through those roles. And so now that person's the builder and they're the block giver. And it's okay if sometimes you have to say the pen hander outer. <laughs> Like sometimes that is the job. You're the pen hander outer, or I guess you could say the pen giver. It's just as simple as that. You just really assign a label to the role or the responsibility and make sure that it's clearly explained, clearly defined, so everybody knows exactly what their responsibility is. So let me give you an example of a co-regulation task you could do with your child. If you were to sweep the floor with your child and your child holds the dustpan and you hold the broom, you have to be co-regulated with each other to get the dirt into the dustpan. I'm the sweeper, you're the dustpan holder. That's a very clear role. Another example, if you're working on co-regulation with unloading the dishwasher, I am the taker outer and you're the put away, right? Maybe your child has to put away the dishes and you are the one that take them out of the dishwasher and give it, or vice versa. You are the dish giver. That might sound a little better. You're the dish giver. I'm the dish taker, or you're the taker outer, I'm the put away. It's fine for it not to be a real word. The, the whole point is just that it clearly defines what your role is and what my role is. So that's it. That's the recipe for a successful interactive group game for autistic individuals. I'm gonna review them really quick and then I'm gonna give you some actual examples of activities and games that we do in our buddy group classes. Then I'm gonna give you um, some specific examples for my teens and adults that we use and then some for my younger groups. So number one, it must be interesting and fun for all the participants involved. Number two, there must be a shared goal that the group is working towards that everybody cares about achieving. Number three, the students must genuinely need each other or the group participants, whoever's in the group, must genuinely need each other in order to complete that goal or achieve that goal. And number four, there must be clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Let's get into some actual examples of games. This one I really, really love, and you can do it with younger kids. You can do it with any ages. Balloon races. And usually I divide the group into two teams. So then we're getting into that competition nature. They have to travel across a space, across the room per se, and I put an empty box at one end and I have a box filled with balloons at another end. The goal is whoever can get all their balloons from this side of the room into the box and the other side of the room first is the winner. The way that we get the balloons across the room is without hands, you have to hold the, the balloon between your heads. You can also hold it between your bellies if you'd rather that, but hold it, the balloon between your foreheads to walk from one side of the room to the other and then get the balloon in the empty box. This is very interesting and fun when I do it with my students. There's a shared goal. The shared goal is we have to get these balloons from one side of the room to the other. They're motivated to do it because it's a really fun way to do it where you have to use your head and no hands. There's clearly defined roles. They're both the balloon carriers, but they have very clear expectations of how to do that. And they need each other to complete this goal. Either it's impossible, well, nearly impossible, to carry a balloon from one side of the room to the other using with your forehead if you don't have a partner to help hold it there with you. So it fulfills all of the requirements. That is an activity that my students really, really enjoy. We had to kind of take a break from it during COVID because obviously it, you have to be in close proximity with each other to do it. But now that things are clearing up in that respect, we're able to incorporate that again. And the kids really, really love this activity. Try it at home with your family. Have the siblings be a team. Maybe siblings versus parents. How motivating is that? And it usually works when you have somewhat equal heights <laughs> to do this activity. Next, we have tower building with scooters. So I find that anytime I can incorporate my students sitting on scooters and they get to ride the scooter around the room. And usually I use those platform scooters, you know, the ones that we had in gym class when we played crab soccer. Anybody remember crab soccer? No? Just me? <laughs> I like to use those scooters. For this, I divide the group into teams. 
And there is a race again. So then we're building in the competition, which makes it fun and interesting. The goal is you have to build the tower before the other team. And the payoff is that once you build the tower, one team member gets to push the other team member into the tower of blocks to knock them down. We use the cardboard brick blocks from Melissa and Doug. So the towers get pretty high and you can crash into them and it doesn't hurt. <laughs> My students love that. They find that to be really fun and motivating. And the way that I visualize that is before class, I build the tower and there's a picture of the tower that they refer to to know how to build the tower and they're given the same blocks that they need to build the tower and they have to take turns riding the scooter over to the other side of the room to put their block on they ride the scooter back it's the next person's turn they get to ride the scooter over put the block on ride it back until the block tower is built and whoever pushes their teammate into the tower to crash it down first is the winner so it's fun and interesting they have a shared goal of building the tower and then pushing each other into it to knock it down. They genuinely need each other to knock it down and they're taking turns to build the tower. Usually what I have is one person is the block giver and the other person is maybe the builder or the scooter rider. Whoever's a scooter rider has to ask the block giver for the block that they need to put on to the tower. That's how I make it so that they need each other in the activity as opposed to just like a waiting while their other person takes the turn. There's clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Another take on this I call collaborative tower building. So I do this when I don't necessarily have a group that can be separated into teams for the block building or they're too big to ride the scooters and it's very similar i take a picture of a huge tower and then i divide the materials that, that are needed to build the tower into however many bags or boxes that i need for however many students i have in the group so however many family members you have participating or students if you're a teacher or a therapist let's say we have four people participating in this activity you would need three boxes or three bags because you would always have one builder and three block givers and you can build these towers with other materials besides blocks but i try to make sure that there is a, a mismatch of materials in each bag so that it's not like whoever's the asker the block builder goes to they're going to get a yes i want them to get a no occasionally so that they have to problem solve and say okay i gotta know what do i do now they have to, oh i have to go ask someone else to see if they have it and believe it or not that little hiccup of oh i need a blue block do you have a blue block no i don't have a blue block that is like a record scratch sometimes in these activities with some of my students they're like oh what do i do now they said no and i urge you if you do this activity or something similar to it i urge you don't jump in don't rescue your child too quickly wait pause i say this all the time you guys are probably sick of hearing me saying it but pause and see if your child or your student can problem solve on their own what to do. If it starts to seem like they're getting frustrated, they're losing interest in the activity, they're at a loss, they're starting to panic, then that's an indication that you might need to help them out. I usually do that with a declarative statement saying like, hmm, I wonder if someone else has a blue block. I'm not saying go ask someone else. I'm not giving a direction. I'm making a statement, which is giving a clue, and it enables them the opportunity to continue to problem solve. So then they all work together, and we shift roles and responsibilities during this activity to build the tower, and then they get to the, the payoff of getting to knock it down together, which is the end goal that they all want to do. <laughs> Another game that I have created, I have this game called Cooking Cookies. It comes in this little tin. It looks like, remember those old school aluminum lunch boxes? It comes in a tin that looks like a mini lunch box. And it's great. It has different recipes for cookies and all the different ingredients are the cookies. And it comes with these spoons that have suction cups. So I took this game and I created a new version of it. 
where someone has the recipe card and the recipe card has all the different ingredients that they need. I think there's five ingredients. There's like the butter, the flour, the sugar, and then like there's peanut butter cookies. So peanut butter, I can't remember what the fifth ingredient is. We've defined the roles, the baker and the ingredient getter. One person has the recipe card. We could call them the, the baker. They're the one combining the ingredients. I put the cookies with all the different ingredients face down on the other side of the room. So the ingredient getter has to go to the baker or the recipe holder and say, what ingredient do you need? And the recipe holder says, I need butter. So they go over and they have to smack the cookies to find the butter and then go back to the recipe holder or the baker, give them the ingredient and then ask what other ingredient do you need? And again, I separate the groups into teams and we have to see who can find their ingredients first, which makes it interesting and fun, is incorporating that movement. There's very defined roles. You might wanna search Amazon, cooking cookies is the game. And if not, you can make your own. You could just create a recipe with pictures of simple ingredients on it. And then you can just create little cookies that have the ingredients. You can even write the words on it. So that would be really simple to recreate. If you have any questions about that, let me know in the comments. I'd be happy to help you build that game for yourself. It's a, it's a fun one. Let's talk about some co-regulation group activities for younger kids. Parachute activities are so, so great for this age group, especially for kids that have a high level of distractibility. They maybe have a high level of self-stimulatory behavior, or they have a lot of interior mo monologue happening and they might be a little bit difficult to engage especially with their peers parachute activities are so great because it gives all the students something to do at the same time and yet they have to coordinate their movements coordinate their actions in order to get the parachute to do what we want it to do there's great videos on youtube that i use as video models to create that visual representation of the goal you can just do parachute songs where you're following directions of like walking or running or waving the parachute. You can play games like popcorn with the ball. You can try to roll a ball to certain people in the group. There's so many fun things you can do with parachute activities. And that is a great co-regulation activity for younger kids. Drum circles are another great activity. And actually the parachute activities and the drum circles, they don't just have to be for younger kids, older kids, teens, adults, like it's lots of fun. You just need to do it on a bigger scale. You need bigger materials for the older kids. But drum circles too, you can do with any age, but they work really well for younger kids. The way that I make it so that there's clearly defined roles and responsibilities is we take turns being the leader. So we're either the leader or the follower. And the goal is the group has to follow and match whatever the leader is drumming. So to match what the leader is drumming, we have to be co-regulated. You have to be engaged with the leader. You have to be following and connected with the leader to match what they are doing. The kids really, really enjoy this activity and it's a great one to really build that co-regulation muscle. Another way that I've incorporated these principles with younger groups, I have one of those ball tracks that does all these sorts of things. You put the ball down at the top. It's got like a trampoline. It goes through the loop-de-loop. -loop. I work together with the students to build the ball track together. And I actually created a Google slideshow that showed each step of how to build the ball track together. I divide the materials up between all the students. So one person's the builder and they have to ask another student for the piece. So even though there's a little bit of wait time in this activity, everybody has a genuine role because they could at any time be asked to give a piece of the track. And then the shared goal, the end goal is they get to play with the ball track. And what I like to do at the beginning is I show them a video of how the ball track works so that they're motivated to persist through the building of the ball track to get to the payoff of being able to play with it. Scooter balloon. So this is another game that requires co-regulation and it's simple and easy, lots of fun. You just put a bunch of kids on scooters and you have them try to keep a balloon or a beach ball in the air as much as possible. So they have to be co-regulated and keeping their focus on the item of the balloon together. They're having a shared focus, a shared point of attention, and that's what they need to be co-regulated. You can make it a game as to the goal is try to beat their time. You could time how long were we able to keep the ball in the air, how many hits. You can count the hits and see if 
oh, we, we were able to do five hits. Let's see if we can beat five. And that keeps it engaging and motivating for them to continue to participate. <laughs> all right. Woo. That was a lot. I thought this was going to be like a little quick video for you all, but it ended up being pretty in depth. I really hope you enjoyed it. I really hope that you start to incorporate this four step process into creating the perfect interactive games for your autistic children or your autistic students, because it really has been so powerful for me in my buddy group program in helping my students have fun with each other, connect with each other and genuinely interact with each other without me needing to guide the interaction every step of the way. It really has been a game changer. Like always, please like the video, share, subscribe, comment below. And if you're interested in Buddy Group, go to buddygrouprocks.com and I hope to see you there. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you next time. Bye.